This episode is brought to you by Podbean, the easiest, most affordable option to get started in podcasting. Stay tuned to hear how you can get your first month of Podbean for free. Hey, everybody, welcome back to another episode of Committed Critics, a pop culture podcast where we're not only committed to our opinions, but also each other. Aww. Aww. I'm Kevin Lau. I am Zachary Wright, and we are back with another special guest star this week. Special guest star, who are you? Hi, my name is Davey Peppers, and thank you so much for having me back. I'm back. I'm back from the dead. And honestly, this just means that. (laughs) <laughs> this just means that my opinions last episode weren't so awful that I wasn't ever brought back, which was a fear of mine. <laughs> Davey, you single-handedly helped us get through the indie episode because I had no <laughs> idea what we were talking about. <laughs> so that episode was on your shoulders, my friend. <laughs> Brian and I were yeah, screwed. Yeah, unfortunately, unfortunately, I couldn't make it to that one due, due to a family emergency, but uh, everything's fine now. It's better. I'm here. We're talking to Davey. Yes. Who is- Maybe that's why I'm... Maybe that's why I'm so buff after that episode because I was carrying it on my back. Exactly, your back hurt. <laughs> yeah, that's that's my uh, that's my karate martial arts voice. I love like, it. Yeah, I'm strong. Yeah, you pussy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Uh man, but if you guys missed out on Davey's episode with, on indie games, highly recommend checking that out. Really good, really great discussion topic on independent games. Uh, but if you missed it out. I want to say that Davey has a YouTube channel called Game Mechanics. He is a critic and editor for oneofus.net, and he has a website called DaveyPeppers.com, spelled just like his name, all one word, that has the link to all of his work on there, correct? Indeed. So I've got the stuff that you mentioned and some other stuff, various articles that I've written for various websites or just different projects that I've that have that I've been lucky enough to have been allowed to contribute my nonsense towards. Nice. Cool. cool I cool. love nonsense. Uh, speaking of nonsense, today's episode is about Cobra Kai. <laughs> Kevin, we did, we got uh, real I didn't mean in, to diss Cobra Kai like that. We got real in your diss Cobra Kai because it's a marvel of a show. It is, but it's like, it's really good nonsense. That's just what I want to say. Listen, like, Kevin, you if, know. You, if you give one more sly diss to Cobra Kai, I'll put you in the ground like Miguel. <laughs> okay, only oh. positive, positive vibes, only here on out, positive vibes. Uh, just so you guys know, if you guys haven't seen Cobra Kai, this is going to be a spoiler-filled episode going all the way to season three. Uh, if you want a spoiler-free episode, you can check out Davey's podcast linked in the description on oneofus.net, where he just kind of, he and his buddies talk about Cobra Kai season three, spoiler-free. I listened to it. It was a really good episode, and you guys should definitely check it out. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, essentially, if we were going to do a spoiler-free episode, it'd just kind of be the same thing. So yeah, why, exactly. why be redundant? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so Cobra Kai man what a show the sequel to the Karate Kid you know the 80s classic movie with uh, Ralph Macchio and uh, Paul Morita you know wax on wax off all that di- all that biz but um, Cobra Kai is a sequel after that 80 years later to present day talking about the, basically the Did next you generation 80 of years Kid. later I thought I said 20 but what 40 I swear whatever to God you said 80 but I'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> I think you said 80 whatever 80s 80 years later <laughs> in 2060 uh but with <laughs> cobra kai 2077 <laughs> oh god uh, i'd watch it because the show is actually pretty good but speaking of the show what was uh, not, what was one thing that kind of like stuck out to you the most in these first three seasons we'll start with uh let's start with D- uh zach uh so for me i really love just how like cheesy it was, all was like it's very cheesy right but it's still so good and so fun that's the important part it is so much fun to watch you sit there and you're like okay this is very like i roll teen drama sometimes but then you get to the fights or these like awesome moments or like these nostalgia hits and these beats and just like yeah f yeah let's go like there's so many like get hype let's go moments right and i just love that like you can tell the writers like grew up grew up with karate kid when they're younger and so they have a really like fun like nostalgia for it and like uh, like heart for it and that is translated so much into the writing like they care about the karate kid 
and like what it like what the legacy of like Mr. Miyagi means, right? So like mm-hmm. Mr. Miyagi is this like not even a per he's got like a concept. Like he is what like Daniel is still trying to like live up to. And the show is trying to live up to like right. Karate Kid in the same sense. And it's just so good. And I wa- I was in the mood for it when I watched it. And it just it was the right time. It was a combination of all the right things. I love this thing so much. Yeah, no, I really love how um, Mr. Miyagi is handled in the episode as, like you said, a concept and where like they didn't try to replace him or like do a CGI Mr. Miyagi. Um, oh, God, that it's... would be terrible. <laughs> you, CGI Mr. Miyagi on a uh, YouTube Red budget. That would be amazing. Oh. <laughs> no, but like they use this for Miyagi. Like, they use flashbacks and clips from the original yeah. films and they use it in like the right emotional beats to like like when uh like they're training like he's trying to like man, like remind Sam like hey like we all have fear and like it cuts back to like mm-hmm. the fight with I think Mike Barnes and Mr. Yagi he's like no like hey like come on get over your fear and so that's what Sam uses to like help like fight Tori and it was great and I feel like that's a good segue to what Davey has to say about uh, the show yeah so and I mentioned this to you guys before we started recording but when I was about to start watching the show, I had never seen any of the Karate Kid movies, so I binged through all five of them, including the Jaden Smith movie where they don't learn karate, <laughs> they learn kung fu, <laughs> which I cannot properly explain how terrible that is. Yes. Oh, 100%. <laughs> the wrong martial art. Um, but, so I watched all of those, loved the Karate Kid, loved the Karate Kid Part 2, that's the end of the sentence. <laughs> And then I went on to watch Cobra Kai. And what I love so much, both in terms of as a continuation of the the original series, specifically the original three films, is how much it rewards you for being familiar with the texts. Mm-hmm. But it's ne- it never feels, at least to me, it never feels in a way where if you don't get, if you're not super familiar with it, you feel excluded or left out. Right. We were mentioning in season three, there are a lot of callbacks to the third act of The Karate Kid Part 2, where, where Danny goes back to Okinawa. It's completely changed, and we have a lot of re- reunions with some of the characters from that film. But in particular, the little girl that he saves during the storm at the end of that movie. And when she shows up and they do the flashback, yes, it's cheesy. Yes, it's like pulling at your emotional strings. But when it clicked for me and I was like, oh, that's that's the kid he saved. I started I started crying. Honestly, it is it is a show that is never afraid to have its heart out on its sleeve. It is never almost surprisingly for a show ostensibly that follows Johnny Lawrence, someone so afraid of looking stupid. It is never a show that is scared of being too sentimental and is never scared of being goofy. Right. It is a show that has, it has so much confidence in itself, but not in a cocky or arrogant way. It just, it knows what it is trying to do and how to do it so well. But even past, Oh, I remember that thing from that movie that I like the way that a lot of the plot threads are set up and pay off between seasons and how things kind of get rewritten and reorganized over (laughs) the course of the three seasons that we have. It is, it is a show that is designed to reward people that enjoy it, but it without ever feeling fan servicey. It is, it, it is the goofiest four course meal you will ever have. And I think to back up what you're saying there, uh, Davey, like they do that with the flashbacks. So like they sh- like you probably can watch. You, you didn't need to binge watch all these movies. Like, yeah, you have that like um, hist- history and you know what the movies were. But, like I've only seen the first Karate Kid and I read the Wikipedia's for the second part two and part three. Right. Yeah. So like when I went in, like I'm like, oh, OK, but I still understood like the show did a good job of like queuing in all the people who haven't seen Karate Kid. And like you still get those flashbacks. There are probably you could probably watch all of the Karate Kid movies via these flashbacks in the show. Like there are, or at least you could watch, or you could watch the good parts. The show also is very intentional about knowing what parts of the franchise are good and which parts aren't. And Mm -hmm. I think like the second or third episode, uh, Daniel's wife ribs him and is like, 
hey, at least it's a better idea than uh, starting a bonsai tree shop, yeah. which is what they do in the widely hated third film. <laughs> and it just felt like a really self-aware and good-natured nod towards that movie's failings. And it's I really like what they do and understanding that the series was not perfect. Right, and then they bring back, like, the only good part of Karate Kid 3 when uh, Danny, when he was young, he was, he would join Cobra Kai. Right, yeah. Kind of, like, talked about that a little bit. Like, oh, yeah, like, the only good part of Karate Kid 3. Thank you. Thank you. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. So, Kevin, what do you think about, what do you think about Cobra Kai so far? What stuck out most to you? So... So, uh, so I, I agree with Davey that like the, it's a show that re- rewards your investment. And I think, you know, especially as the show itself as a standalone, if you, it, um, even though season one isn't the greatest, I feel like once you get to season three, like you're, you're being really rewarded for sticking around with the series because season one to me is like the bare minimum of good television, which I found really hilarious when I was watching it. Like I was like, oh, it's like, I was like, I was texting Zach. Uh, when I was watching season one, I was like, man, I wish this was like the bare minimum of what, what was on TV. Yeah. Um, because the fact that this is like the bare minimum of what good, I or I believe good television to be, where it's just like, yeah, you have your, like, you know, you have your character motivations, you have your, um, you have your emotional through line. Um, you know, everything still makes sense. Like, it's just that some of it just isn't as compelling as it can be. Whereas like, I like, I found Johnny and Danny's relationship really interesting, but then I like the kids, I just didn't really care about because I felt like their, their own, their personal problems just did not speak to me. And also they were just really cheesy, just kind of like, oh, I've seen this before, whatever. But, you know, but that's what Karate Kid is, is, you know, high schoolers learning karate. <laughs> exactly. Uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I know it does. The show does get better as it goes on. Like, I, like in halfway through season two was when I was really invested into it. That, that there was like an episode that kind of stops the plot in season two. Whereas like some, some people may consider that dull, but I felt like that was like one of the best episodes in the series when Danny learns how to balance his work life and his karate life and all that stuff. Um, I feel like that's a really great universal message that also goes, that ties into the core themes of basically all the Karate Kid movies. Cause you know, it's all about, cause Karate Kid is about using the, philo- applying the philosophy of karate uh, into your everyday life. And and I think th- this show does that really well. Um, I just do wish the first season was better. But like I said, if you stick around with it, you know, you get it gets much better and you get rewarded for sticking around. A lot of times I told Kevin, like, just let it happen. Just like have fun with it. Like, don't think. Quick. Oh, yeah. I might like, turn off your critical part of your brain. Like, it's all right. Just just let it flow look, down the look, river. Look, Zach, I was having fun with it. I just wanted to troll you. It didn't sound hard. like you're having fun with it, Kevin. It didn't <laughs> sound like you're having fun. I would point out very obvious continuity errors or like plot holes. It was like, yeah, like, how did this happen when this was supposed to happen? Oh, but anytime I point out a plot hole in a movie Kevin like, he's like, oh, don't worry about it. The pilot in Wonder <laughs> Woman. Uh. Look, man, sometimes some people misconstrue what a plot hole is. I think Karate Kid only, I think Cobra Kai only has one plot hole in it. Um, that's act, like, I consider the like, actual plot hole, but it's like also, you can, yeah, you can kind of fill it in somehow. And that is? And that is uh, Robbie. Uh, is it his name, Robbie? Uh, yeah, Johnny's Robbie. kid? Yeah. yeah. Robbie, like, uh, he and the Sam leave to go, leave to go take him home, but then they go to the party, but then, uh, uh, Sam gets punched, and so they go back to, and then Robbie goes back to the LaRusso's house in the dojo, um, just hanging out, uh, when he was supposed to be gone at home, so. But Sam just got whatever. punched. Whatever, I'm not gonna argue with it. I'm chalking this up to <laughs> yeah, Kevin, it, just, whatever. whatever. <laughs> like, that's, like, as, this is a weird hole of information. Yeah, like. Uh, on one hand, yes, I guess kind of a hot a plot hole, but also a they're stupid teenagers. Who cares? And b it's the Karate Kid right. show. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, no, like I, I'm not like actually harping on it for that. Like that, that's like I feel like that's the only actual plot hole. Plus, there's like the the continuity error, which there was. It's not focused on enough to be a plot hole. Uh, where like uh, you know when that the fight on the beach when Robbie gets jumped, but Danny saves him and then he films yeah. it all on his phone. Mm-hmm. He never picks up the phone. The phone you clearly see the phone left on the stairs on the beach. Oh, <laughs> uh, and then he pulls out the phone and a couple a uh, couple scenes later. Oh, look at this video I got. <laughs> he technically grabs the phone like later on, but he never grabs Amanda's wallet. <laughs> He just leaves the wallet there. <laughs> and I'm like, all right, I guess your whole point, whatever. Rip. Okay, cool. Ah, <laughs> oh, man. Uh, but moving on, what what is another thing that stuck out to you guys? Like for me, 
another thing I really want to talk about is that Ralph Macchio is so good He's in this role. So good. But like so good in terms of the show, right? Like Right. Like he's like he he's like he, I feel like he's a, such a great I will suburban say it. dad. I'll say it. God God damn it, I will say it. He is a better Luke Skywalker than Luke Skywalker ever was in the sequel trilogy, and I stand by it. Well Yeah, what are you gonna say, Kevin? Davy? What are you gonna say, Kevin? <laughs> I mean feel- here's the thing. Cobra Kai is written by one cohesive team and is exactly. uh, ping-ponged around from someone who is really good at replicating things and exactly. someone who is really good at pushing things further and going back and forth and back and forth into infertility, whereas this show actually has one clear cohesive vision and isn't mm-hmm. ch- segmented and chopped up to appease a bunch of whiny nerds. Yes. So, right. I yes. mean, like, I I love The Last Jedi. I love Luke in The Last Jedi. Oh, I do too. I do too. Yeah, don't get me wrong here. Yeah, but it also lived like with, but I do have to agree with Zach that uh, Daniel's character, as a consistent whole, going across three seasons so far, it's yeah, it's much better handled than the entire sequel trilogy of Star Wars. <laughs> it's it's almost like um, to properly tell a story, you have to have some form of unifying vision, and also it's it's almost like it's impossible to continue the legacy of the most popular media franchise in modern times and in order to say something interesting you should probably let the most popular things go and focus on new stories or ways to reinterpret things that have fallen to time what a wild concept (laughs) yeah and on that note we're gonna take a quick break and we'll be right back Starting a podcast? Try a Podbean Unlimited hosting plan. It's what we use here at Committed Critics, giving us the opportunity to have our show on Pandora, iHeartRadio, and even Spotify. You can get your first month of unlimited hosting for free on us by going to podbean.com slash committed crits, just like our Twitter, or by clicking the link in the description. Podbean, the easiest, most affordable option to get started in podcasting. So, Zach, what was the other point that you want to bring to the table? I liked how each character was fleshed out to a degree. So, like, like, yeah, like, like I said, Robbie is the better Kylo Ren. Sure, whatever. Bad, bad analogy. Mm-hmm. But, like, he is fleshed out. Like, he has, a tr- like, a hard, trouble like, home life. And you sympathize with him. Sam, like, yeah, she's, like, she's even fleshed out. Like, she gets PTSD at the end of season two. And she has to learn how to overcome that. Even Tori, this chaotic, <clears throat> excuse me. This chaotic, <laughs> evil, she really has nothing, she has, does nothing for the plot besides, like, antagonize Sam. She is out for blood. She's <laughs> out for blood. But you still have, like, some ounce, like, a small ounce of sympathy for her because of how bad her home life is. Yeah, she's still a raging villain, and we really don't care about her in the end. But, like, even Kreese, for example, like, he gets a whole backstory in Vietnam. Like, mm-hmm. just the amount of writing, like, like I said in the beginning, like, how much like writing and time they put into this property like as kids and so they put it into like this property now they truly care to make it like like to respect what was um made in the beginning in like the 80s yeah right yeah and i think davy you mentioned this in your podcast too where it's like you know you, it's a show about empathy at its core where like you know you learn to empathize with the villains and characters like you may not agree with them but you kind of see where they're coming from right yeah, it, it, it rides that really wonderful line, I think, between everyone has a story and everyone is right. Because, no, the show very clearly says these people are right, these people are wrong. But also, it is worth it to understand why the people who are wrong came to the conclusions they right. did and why that is not an immediate death sentence, yeah. so to speak. Mm-hmm. And I think even to that degree, like, in the first couple seasons, like, there really is, like, no right or wrong like daniel is wrong plenty of times like he is an asshole yeah and you like you're rooting for johnny like in the tournament like you're rooting for miguel even though miguel is clearly on the dark side almost like he is tiptoeing that line that like johnny did in the first karate kid Mm -hmm. and going more towards what cobra kai actually is and then by the end of season three you're cheering for you're cheering for both johnny and daniel to team up to face the final evil which is john crease and cobra kai I hope they kick his ass. <laughs> oh, dude. Do you, oh, I. I firmly believe that Daniel was going to kill Kreese outside of the dojo. And then Sam and. Oh, 100%. Sam Miguel showed up. That's what stopped him. 
Daniel was ready. Mm -hmm. He was he like you saw it in his eyes. And like that is that is a testament to Machio and also a testament to William Zabka, because when he gives him that nod and Daniel's eyes go dark, it's like, oh, you're about to take a life. Uh I'm like, oh, (laughs) (laughs) and like, honestly, I wouldn't blame you. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, And then Miguel and Sam show up and that's the only thing that stops him. Yeah. Oh, that nod is so good. It's so good. Yeah, no, Daniel is such a, like, a really, he's put into a corner, essentially, because, like, he has to protect his family. Like, if he keeps this evil going on longer, like, he's putting his more his family in more danger. And it's not just, like, it's not just his kid is in danger, but also his business. So, like, it affects a lot of elements of his life. His business, his kids, even his kids' friends, like, not so this evil doesn't spread anymore. That way, like, Robbie, like, even Robbie's soul is at stake at this point. Like, Robbie has turned to Cobra Kai. Like, Robbie's soul is at stake. And I am firmly predicting there'll be a Robbie Redemption part in season four, season five. There has to be. Tori, not so much. Tori will be damned to hell, but. <laughs> right. I do. Th- um, <laughs> I think, I think Tori, I think Tori's redemption arc is walking away from Cobra Kai. I think that is the farthest that she can go as a redemption arc. I agree. Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, but David, did you have another point that you want to bring to the table? I did. The, the difficult thing about talking about this show is that it all kind of dovetails into other things and continues to move forward so i'm gonna probably be a little quicker with this go ahead yeah i like how differently the writing functions season three versus the first two seasons so as we mentioned the first two seasons were on youtube red and it was kind of youtube red's only big thing only thing because of (laughs) only thing yeah basically and because of that and because of the instability of launching a new platform. It was very clear with those first two seasons that they were being written with the express purpose of this could be the only thing we get to do. Right. So we might as well, even with cliffhangers like the season two cliffhanger, which is a fantastic ending. Oh yeah. That's that fight in the school. It's great. And it's sorry, Dave, not to cut you off, but that fight in the school, I just want to, no, it's all good. I want, I want to talk about that real quick. The fight in the school is one of the best scenes in television I've seen in a while. Like the single cam, like almost daredevil style, like staircase fight. Yeah. Where it's just like you're seeing each kid take on like their like darker half or like anti half or whatever. Like Robbie versus Miguel, Sam versus Tori. Even the two little kids and the two bigger kids <laughs> fighting each other on each side. Hawk versus Dimitri. Uh, like so. Oh, oh what. A, so good. Uh, what, a, what a wonderful just like. I'm so sorry, kicks him into the trophy case. Yeah. Uh, I mean, like, yeah, it does. I feel like yeah, I don't know, Karate Kid, I mean, sorry, Cobra Kai does this really well of like blending action with drama where, where, with how it pairs like the certain characters up against each other. It's like it adds a lot of dramatic conflict already on top of the physical conflict. But, you know, obviously the physical conflict is just, oh, this kid's doing karate. It's really cool and really cheesy. But, um, but you see how dangerous it can be with all these kids are in a brawl. Like the, the teachers are like, no, f- we're not gonna we're not gonna get involved oh, yeah. in this like, we don't get paid enough <laughs> yeah though no, like you guys said like it's not afraid to like hold back or anything you say just you know just going going straight through that brick wall yeah and each one of the kids has their own motivation like sam and tori have to fight and miguel's like we have to stop this and robbie's like no and robbie goes after miguel and it's like <laughs> wait no hang on uh but david what what were you saying about like how it was on yeah what were you yeah. saying david i'm sorry i may cut you off no it's all it's all good it was it was for a good cause so that ending of season two, while it is an incredible cliffhanger, it wraps up the arcs in such a way where if the show had to end, if there was no more money in YouTube Red, that's fine. Season three is the first season where the arcs are not complete, and it was clearly written to set up for a season four. And I think there was some disillusionment with people who were what who weren't because i watched this third season in one sitting like oh that was gosh. how i started this new year is i sat down and i watched five hours of cobra kai <laughs> and it was the best new year's day i've ever had <laughs> nice it's such a, it's and, a really good season mm-hmm. it really is but it definitely starts off a little slower and a little more contemplative and i saw people online being concerned about it And so when I would tell people that it is a great season, I would have to tell them, this is not the explosion. This is not the climax of the show. This is the setup for season four. And this is the payoff for season two. It is a bridge season. It's an incredibly well-written one. And I think it's one that utilizes the talent and the resources that they now have on Netflix. But I think 
watching the creators realizing they have a little more space and a little more security to tell the story in a slightly larger and more detailed way is something that when season four comes out and we get to look at those four seasons and if anything comes afterwards, we get to look at it and say it was really good that they had that space to tell the story in the way that they wanted to do it. And that is just a really, it's a really interesting dichotomy between the two because most shows that switch networks or switch platforms, at least I feel it's never as immediately noticeable of a shift in the way that the stories are structured. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the one thing. Yeah, no, definitely. Cause I, cause I, when I was watching season three, I felt, I thought I was under the mentality of this is going to be the final season. So uh, the, like the first four or five episodes kind of really feel like it's building up to that climax. But then in like, it kind of like once you reach season five, episode five or six, it kind of like that feeling of building up kind of plateaus. And I was like, wait a second, is this not the final season? Um, and I was getting a little bummed out that it wasn't the final season, but like knowing that it is going to get a season four um, and kind of like seeing what they built up, like I'm really actually really pumped for season four. So question for you guys, how long, how many more seasons do you think there needs to be? Like, I know like Netflix will try and get their money's worth. Like, I don't want this to be like dr- long and drawn out. Right. I think one more season, season four, maybe a season five and that's it. But I think one more season. I think I think a 13 episode season four will be I agree. the end of this. I think they're going to do a slightly longer season, but I think it's going to be the end. I hope so. Yeah, I don't want to get dragged on longer than it like it should be. No, I agree. I think season four is the final thing because I don't know. It's I mean, you could I could say like, oh, it's because, you know, if they do the turn, if they win a tournament, then Crease is gone forever. But, you know. Maybe maybe that builds up to something else. You never know. Something right, yeah. something unfortunate can come their way. Like Terry Silver. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> <laughs> Karate Kid Part Three's back, baby, <laughs> baby. <laughs> or Hillary Swank comes in and takes over. <laughs> oh man, I want Hillary Swank to come in. She has she has mentioned that she would be willing to show up. We got Elizabeth Shue back. Get Hillary Swank. I, I do think we're getting a they Hillary. Get Hillary Sw- I think we're getting a Hillary Swank cameo. We ha- oh, yeah. They have to because Netflix has worked with her. They worked with her on Away, so Netflix has that contact. They will a hundred percent. But uh, I know the show isn't done yet. But how would you rate each uh, the show out of five, and how would you rate each season individually? Dave, you go first. Uh, overall, I'm gonna give it a four and a half out of ten because this show. Whoa, Whoa wait, what? <laughs> That's pretty low. <laughs> oh shit! Four and a half out of five. Sorry, I I rarely I rarely do out of fives, and so it just like <laughs> broke my brain. Nine out of ten. I like to do it out of ten. It's it's a nine out of ten show. Yes. I would say the first season is probably more of a seven or eight out of ten. Then it gets to like a harsh like nine nine and a half out of ten for season two. I'd say season three is around an eight and a half or a nine. This show is so successful at doing what it wants to do so well. It's an old Roger Ebert quote that basically says, and I'm going to paraphrase, it is not how good a film is to you. It is how successful a film or a television show or whatever, Mm -hmm. how successful it is at what it is trying to do. Mm -hmm. And for what Cobra Kai is trying to do to be a, feel good, cheesy, reminiscent of the 80s and of those tropes without leaning into, for example, some of the more dicey elements of a lot of 80s films, not necessarily Karate Kid, but the decade as a whole, right, yeah. culturally speaking, I don't think it gets better than this. I don't think, like, you have this and you have Bill and Ted Face the Music, and I think both of those are perfect examples of it it really doesn't get better than this in terms of revivals. We've seen so many half-baked, mm-hmm. cynical revivals and finally seeing these two projects in particular that were clearly made with so much love and reverence because the franchises aren't mm-hmm. big enough and financially stable enough to be a cash grab. Right. I think it's just a wonderful, wonderful thing. And... I would be stunned if we ever get a show that is trying to do what Cobra Kai is doing better than Cobra Kai. I agree with you 100%. Oh, definitely. 100%. Like, it might have a better start, but I, I think it'll definitely dwindle out uh, afterwards. Oh, yeah, totally. And, like, there are shows that are better. There's Breaking mm-hmm. Bad. There's The Sopranos. There's The Leftovers. <laughs> there's The Good Place. There's Crazy Ex-Girlfriend. I could literally do this until I die. Right. 
but there is no better show that is going for the specific feeling that this show is going for. Because like I said, this show is my happy place. I watch it and it just fills me with so much joy. Like I can hear the serotonin <laughs> receptors just being like, all right, pull the lever, Krog, let's go. <laughs> I love that. I love that so much. <laughs> oh, man. My my rating is to keep it consistent. I'll put it in 10s. I wrote 5s. But overall, I give the show an, an 8 out of 10. Season 1 is a 6 out of 10. Season 2 is a 7 out of 10. And then, like, season 3 is an 8 out of 10. Uh, it does, like I said, it progressively gets better as it goes on. As Davey said, it just it rewards you for, like, sticking around. And, it, you know, like Davey said, you know, it, there's it, Cobra Kai is Cobra Kai. There is no other show like Cobra Kai doing what Cobra Kai is doing. If a show other, if a show tries to copy Cobra Kai, like I said, it may have like a better season one, but after that, like it's not going to end as well as Cobra Kai as we're hoping Cobra Kai. You'll never get a season two brawl in the school. When you just see a bunch of kids doing karate, like what am I watching? But this is awesome. (laughs) Right? Yeah. Suck it. Fuller house. (laughs) Oof, man. (laughs) What about you, Zach? What are your rankings? Um, so I went a little more in depth. So season one, I gave, so to keep for posterity sake, I gave a three out of five. So what would that be? Um, quick, someone do math. Six out of ten. ten. Thank you. Six out of ten. <laughs> you, you multiple, you multiply both numbers by two, by two. I know. I know. I'm not quick on my feet right now. I'm tired. <laughs> it's 4 PM. <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> I gave season one a six out of 10 just cause like, I don't really remember a lot about season one. I'm going to be honest with you. Most of my brain is filled with moments from season two and season three. Yeah. The only thing I remember from season one is the the Owl Valley term at the end. Um, season two, I freaking love season two. The teen drama gets better. You, I love the Robbie and Sam relationship. I love how just cheesy it is. And the finale, like I said, the school brawl itself is just chef's kiss. It's just so good. I gave that a nine out of ten. And then season three, I gave a eight out of ten. The quality is great. It's leagues ahead of season one and season two, thanks to Netflix money and the build up to what will be season four. Like season four should be a 10 out of 10. But God, I hope they don't Game of Thrones it or balls it up somehow. I hope it's going to be so good. Overall, the series is a nine out of 10 right now. It's so flipping good. It is so flipping good. All right. And on that note, we're going to end the episode here. Thank you for listening to another episode of Committed Critics. You can follow us on Twitter at Committed Crits. That's C-O-M-M-I-T-T-E-D-C-R-I-T-S. You can follow us on YouTube as well. Committed Critics spelled the same there as it is here and everywhere else. You can support us on Patreon in the link below. And uh, you can also follow Davey Peppers on Twitter. Uh, Davey Peppers, that is uh, D-A-V-E-Y-P-E-P-P-E-R-S. Um, I might probably <laughs> we'll, it's we'll going to be linked in, in the description we'll get so. his credit in there <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no, you, he's, 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 he's spelled in my there. name correctly you did it congratulations I feel like I said E twice I think it was just the E the V-E thing yeah, there, are, there are a lot of E sounds in my name and there are also just three E's generally yeah wow what a tongue twister that is but you can also check out davypeppers.com spelled the same way <laughs> thank you for coming on davy like thanks for letting me bro out with you being the cool uncle while dad over here is like ah it's not that good Zach. <laughs> <laughs> it, what? It is good it's good <laughs> i'm just giving you crap i'm just giving you crap kevin <laughs> i said it's good <laughs> yeah no uh zach definitely zach definitely has cool uncle energy I might have drunk uncle energy. Who's to say? Oh my God. Are we three's company? Are we three's company? <laughs> oh, I sure hope so. That would be a delight. That's not what three's company is, but cool. <laughs> that- <laughs> That's me and my dad energy right there. It's like, yeah, I've seen three's company. This is not it. <laughs> Back to the full house That's reference. Amazing. You're definitely Danny, Kevin. <laughs> uh, I, mean, I don't even know. I haven't seen full house. So I don't even know who that is, but if it's Danny from Cobra Kai, I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> this has been another episode of Committed Critics. Thank you to Jordan Smearman for being our sound engineer, and we'll see you next week. <laughs> Bye, guys. <laughs> <laughs>